Good evening, everyone. This is Katie Catchman. It is 7.15 p.m. and I call to order the committee of the whole meeting. We'll begin with a roll call by Deputy Clerk Anderson. Thank you. Obi. Here. Thank you. Ellis. Here. Francie. Here. Catchman. Lauren? Present. Thank you. Mackie? Here. Morrison? Here. Ferrucini? Here. Ross? Here. Shaw? Here. Taylor? Here. Shave? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we have U.S. Representative Derek Kilmer joining us as our guest speaker to share some updates. Representative Kilmer is very plugged in with our community and he has really been a huge champion of many of our priorities, including our levy and rail separation projects. Welcome Representative Kilmer, thanks for joining us tonight and I will hand the meeting over to you. Okay, that worked. Hello, <laughs> it's good Hello. to see everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having me and I, I certainly appreciate the invitation to, to join you tonight. Um, before I say anything else, I actually just wanna say thank you for your service. Um, I, I know these have been a really tough couple of years for everybody, for our country, for our community. Um, this pandemic has not only been the most challenging health crisis of our generation, but also the most challenging economic crisis. And I'm just really grateful to each of you on the council um, and to the city staff for really being on the front lines, just trying to help your community. And I want to thank you for that. I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate your partnership. I do think just to start off, it's worth remembering just how far we've come over this last year. Just one year ago, the headlines were really dire. You know, as, as 2020 came to a close, there were articles about our food banks facing record demand about uh, record housing instability. Far too many of our local employers were still really on their heels and most of our kids were still in virtual school. Most of us parents were realizing how bad we were at teaching middle school math, or maybe that was just me. Um, and we had not at that time yet seen the widespread rollout of vaccines. And that's why early in 2021, uh, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, which was really focused on trying to help folks get vaccinated and help our kids get back to school safely and support our local businesses through that Paycheck Protection Program and some targeted um, support for industries that got particularly hit hard, but like our restaurants and our movie theaters and live event venues, and to provide some immediate and direct help to folks just to help keep a roof over their heads and feed their families and, and pay their bills. It had a huge impact, a huge boost for our economy. Since it passed, we've seen over 6.4 million jobs created in our country. 210 million Americans are now vaccinated. Our unemployment claims are the lowest they've been since 1969. Now, part of the reason I mentioned this, important um, for, for your council, um, uh, just a week or so ago, we saw, and hopefully you saw, the final rulemaking by the administration that provided some additional flexibility to local governments to make investments needed by your community. So those funds can be used to expand access to testing and vaccines, to fund water and sewer and broadband projects, to respond to public health and economic impacts, including investments to make services like childcare and affordable housing more affordable. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, as you likely know, and I think the main reason I was invited to visit at the end of last year, Congress passed and the president signed a new bipartisan infrastructure law. That's a lot that's really about putting people to work now and laying the foundation for economic growth over the long haul by investing in roads and bridges, transit and water systems, ports and broadband. It's about recognizing that we can't compete in a 21st century economy with 19th and 20th century infrastructure. So why does it really matter for our community? Well, I represent a district with 19 ports, including the Port of Grace Harbor, and they are amazing engines of economic opportunity. I mean, thankfully there's some help for our ports um, through this new bipartisan infrastructure law to help address repair or maintenance issues, to reduce congestion. Um, that's a big deal. Uh, I represent it and, and we all live in a district um, with a tremendous amount of, of coastline and coastal communities. And there is a substantial amount of new funding for, for resiliency to help 
coastal communities and um, others that may be dealing um, with natural hazards um, from, from rising sea levels or from wildfires or other issues as well. Um, making investments in our infrastructure matters for everybody who's tired of sitting in traffic or worried about roads being shut down. Um, certainly there are parts of the district I represent where the speed limit signs are only there for nostalgic purposes. Um, and we have a lot of bridges that are past their useful life. And um, with this new law, we're going to see the most substantial investment in our roads and bridges since the creation of the interstate highway system. Um, there are some other key parts of this, too. It makes historic investments in transit, which is not just about taking vehicles off the road, but it's about helping workers get to work. Um, it matters to everybody who struggles to log on to a city council meeting uh, via Zoom. You know, um, I represent a district that is unfortunately in the bottom third of the country when it comes to access to high speed Internet. And we've learned over the course of this pandemic that Internet access is not just about whether you can watch the Book of Boba Fett on Disney Plus which you should because it's awesome, but it's about whether your business can operate remotely or whether you can take a remote class at Grace Harbor College or have that telehealth visit with your doctor. And for far too many people, they can't because they don't have internet access. And that's why this new law um, really treats rural broadband like rural electrification was in past generations. Um, and it's expected to connect about a quarter of a million Washingtonians to reliable high-speed internet who currently don't have it. So that's a big deal. There's also some important investments related to water, um, clean water, uh, uh, wastewater, storm water, um, flood prevention. And importantly, um, I led the charge on and Senator Cantwell led the charge in the Senate on a new program uh, related to removing and replacing failing culverts so that we can restore fish passage and help ensure our salmon populations make the recovery we need them to. So um, why am I here? Well, one of my main goals for 2022 is to make sure that now we're going to, now that we're going to see the federal government make some of these investments, that those dollars come to our region and help address our problems. So part of my goal in attending tonight is just to tell you what we know in terms of being able to access those funds. I'll tell you up front, there's some things we don't know yet. Um, I've been on the um, on no, a number of calls with the USDOT and with others trying to make sure we're getting as much information as we can. And there are a lot of questions that just don't have answers yet. But let me at least share with you what we what we know. So let me start with some of the transportation oriented funding that will run through the um, USDOT. I will say up front, a lot of the funds will run through the state. So there's about um, uh, four point seven billion dollars that will go to the state for highway funding. Um, more than 600 million to the state for road funding over the next five years. So one of the things that I can share with you is as you have road priorities, be sure that you're not just communicating to me in our office, but also to um, your state legislative delegation. Having said that, there are some programs through the DOT. The one that will, one of the ones that will open um, for application in this first quarter is called the RAISE program. It's the Rebuilding American Infrastructure Sustainably and Equity equitably program. That's a grant program that got plussed up substantially, seven and a half billion dollars for road, rail, transit, and other surface transportation for local or regional um, needs. Applications will open in this first quarter of 2022 with maximum awards of $25 million. I share that with you because I know um, uh, your community has gone after some of those funds in the past um, for things like the rail separation. Um, as you head into town. And that program got plussed up substantially. So there's a, a real opportunity there. I was just out at the Port of Grace Harbor. Um, part of our conversation was about a new uh, expansion of the port infrastructure development uh, program. Um, that's funding for ports. And the, the, the port has some priorities there. The DOT expects to open up applications in February uh, of this year. There's a program for bus and bus facilities, um, and then a, 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 a couple programs for sort of mega projects, projects that be, might be multi-jurisdictional, um, that could be highway or rail, but that um, would be of, of regional or even national economic significance. Um, they haven't yet sort of given a timeline for those very large, uh, programs, but as we get information, we'll share them with you. I know a lot of the cities I represent are very interested in the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. That's a new program through the DOT to provide funding 
exclusively for local governments to support what's called the Vision Zero Plan um, to reduce crashes and fatalities. That's both for um, vehicle users, but also for cyclists and pedestrians. Applications are expected to open for that in May of this year. There's a, uh, a new program for um, vehicle electric vehicle charging stations and, and fueling infrastructure. Uh, and um, we have not yet seen the timeline on that. Uh, the department is seeking comment on program design by the end of this month. And then my guess is it'll take them a few months to, um, to issue information on that. There is a rural surface transportation grant program through the Department of Transportation that's designed specifically to improve and expand surface transportation infrastructure in rural areas to increase connectivity and improve safety and reliability um, and to generate regional economic growth. We are expecting that application to open in the first quarter of 2022. So that's the transportation programs. And there's other sort of cats and dogs here and there. And as as we get information about those programs, um, I'll, you have my commitment, we'll push them out to the city. And uh, if you have questions about any of those programs, we're happy to provide connections to folks within the Department of Transportation. If you decide to pursue funding for any of those, I'm more than happy um, uh, to provide letters of support. We want these dollars to come to our community. So um, count, count me as a partner. Let me also mention, because of some of the unique challenges in Grays Harbor, a few other programs that might be of interest. I know in the past, communities in Grays Harbor have benefited from the build, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, what's called the BRIC program that runs through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. That's to help communities uh, undertaking hazard mitigation projects to reduce the risks that they face from disasters and other natural hazards. The fiscal year 21, which was last year, applications are actually still open until the end of this week, um, but then they're gonna um, do the fiscal year 22. They don't yet have the time frame for fiscal year 22. It depends on when Congress passes a spending bill, but the latest will be no later than September uh, of this year. Similarly, there is $3.5 billion for the FEMA flood mitigation assistance program. Um, that is a program that can be used for projects to reduce or eliminate the risk of repetitive flood damage to buildings that are insured by the National Flood Insurance Program. FY21 applications are open till the end of, um, of this week, till the 28th. But again, the fiscal year 22 uh, opportunities will open up hopefully soon thereafter. Um, and they again said to not later than September uh, of this year. And it got, for fiscal year 2022, the program got plussed up very, very substantially as part of this infrastructure bill. There are other programs that are focused on everything from clean school buses to brownfield um, cleanup. Uh, a number of programs related to energy efficiency, including some specifically related to energy improvements in rural communities. If you're interested in any of those programs, I'm more than happy um, to provide follow-up details on them. Let me just mention two other areas in the infrastructure uh, arena. Um, I know a lot of local communities have issues related to water and wastewater. Uh, the bill that passed includes $23.4 billion for drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. And it does it, it runs that through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. If you just heard me say the word state twice, it's because those dollars are going to the state. So again, if you have issues on that front, it's worth connecting with the state legislative delegation. There are some smaller grant programs as well that may be of interest. And I'll follow up with some details that the Congressional Research Service just put out regarding some of those smaller grant programs. We'll make sure the city has information about that. Um, last but not least, I just want to cover, um, as part of the infrastructure discussion, um, the broadband. There's um, $65 billion for broadband. $48.2 billion of that is for uh, something called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. That's going to run through the state broadband office. And they're, they're um, required to focus first on unserved areas, then on underserved areas, and then on community anchor organizations. And so my, um, uh, if I can be of any help in connecting with the state broadband office, if folks are interested in that, we're happy to help there. They are gonna have some listening sessions or information sessions in February related to that broadband funding. And um, we'll happily share some of the um, 
uh, the links related to that. There's also specific for, for rural communities, a Department of Ag program called the Reconnect program that will open up a, a round of, uh, of grant opportunities in the third quarter of 2022. Um, and again, as those opportunities come available, we'll push that out to, to you. Um, I have all of this information and more on my website, which is kilmer.house.gov slash infrastructure. Uh, and if you have questions about any of this stuff, just let me know. And again, I'm more than happy to provide a letter of support. Um, we were, um, when I, I mentioned I had a conversation with the administration about this, they gave some information that I thought would be worth sharing. One, you may have projects that are eligible for multiple funding streams and you're encouraged to apply for multiple pots of funding um, as long as you meet the eligibility criteria. There are some specific priorities they, that they encourage applicants to, to highlight in their applications, ways in which your application may create good paying jobs, improve safety, combat inequity and improve quality of life, spur economic competitiveness, combat climate change and promote environmental sustainability and drive innovation. So those are some of the priorities for the administration as they dole out those funds. If I have two more minutes, I'll mention two more things quickly. Do I have two more minutes? Yes, we'll give you okay. two more. Okay. Um, everything I just talked about is things that have passed. Let me mention two things that haven't yet passed, but that that could have a lot of impact for your community. Um, one, uh, you've heard probably about the Build Back Better Act, which is passed out of the House that has not passed out of the Senate. Um, there's been a lot of press attention to the day-to-day -day and sometimes even the minute-to-minute -minute negotiations on that bill. Um, but what's gotten less coverage is kind of what that bill is about. In a nutshell, it's about trying to cut costs for families um, that have really felt the squeeze. Uh, I and I think a lot of us are concerned about rising prices. This is about reducing prices, reducing prices of health care, reducing prices of prescription drugs, reducing the um, cost of child care. I can't tell you how many working parents I've talked to who just really have felt sidelined because they can't find affordable child care. Um, this bill helps with that by, for most American families, cutting what they spend on child care in half, uh, delivering um, uh, free preschool for every three and four year old in our country and giving 35 million families a major tax cut through the child tax credit. It's about um, reducing the cost of going to college or pursuing uh, um, uh, skills training, uh, increases financial aid uh, for college students and um, pluses up some of the Department of Labor workforce development programs. And, and Grace Harbor College does a bang up job of working through some of those programs and now they'll have more success hopefully getting funding through them. I know every time I've visited with the mayor and others on the council, concerns around housing affordability are paramount in your community. And there's the most substantial investment in affordable housing in the history of our country as part of that Build Back Better bill um, to address the uh, public housing repair backlog and to invest in the National Housing Trust Fund to build and preserve more affordable homes. I will mention the bill also includes a bill that I authored, a pilot version of a bill I authored called the Recompete Act which is about trying to help communities that have struggled economically. And I represent a whole bunch of them that have had hard times economically. I grew up on the Olympic Peninsula and um, my observation is communities need more than one-off grants. They need some prolonged support. And so the bill that I introduced would provide flexible 10-year support to communities facing economic distress. The Build Back Better bill, um, as it passed the house, includes enough funding to probably provide 10 um, support for 10, five, probably between five and 15, probably more like 10 regions around the country. Hopefully the Olympic Peninsula would be one of those. Um, just uh, today, a new bill was introduced called the America Competes Act, which also includes that same pilot uh, funding um, to help communities uh, that, that need some help. Other th quick thing I just wanna mention, um, Congress by the end of February needs to pass, by mid-February needs to pass a spending bill as you may recall, um, uh, there, were, um, there was the ability for the first time in more than 10 years, the ability for members of Congress to advocate for specific community projects included in the spending bill as it passed, the House was nine and a half million dollars to address flooding issues in your community. Um, and I'm hopeful we'll see that make it across the, the finish line um, 
the negotiations are ongoing with the Senate. If we can get a spending bill passed, I'm very hopeful that communities like that, that, that community projects like that will get funded. Final thing I just want to say is, um, listen, half my team in the district does what we call casework, where if anybody's grappling with the federal agency, we go to work on their behalf. This last year, it's been a lot with the Small Business Administration, as folks have tried to access some of those pandemic relief programs. Um, but other stuff too, uh, social security, the VA, I represent a ton of military veterans. Our communities are a lot stronger because of those folks who've served our country, but oftentimes they have issues with the VA and we can help with that. Um, lately, it's been a lot of people who are traveling for the first time and didn't realize they have expired passports. Turns out we can help with that too. So I mentioned that because I know many of you and I know how active you are in the community. If you or someone you know has an issue with any federal agency, point them in our direction. We're happy to help. So that's what I got. I'm happy to answer questions if you got them. I know you have a full agenda, so I'm not offended if you need to move on. If anyone has questions, go ahead and come off mute and you can yeah. ask Representative Kilmer. I have a question. I heard a lot about a lot of programs going on, but who pays for those programs? And my question being on that is in this community and in this area, there's not a lot of high paying jobs here. So if we're paying for these programs, we should be able to at least see some of it benefit our community. So that's the idea. I mean, I think thankfully, as you look at the um, uh, the infrastructure bill that passed, um, one, it's paid for, but it's paid for by, by not raising taxes on, on working families. And the Build Back Better bill that I mentioned, um, anybody who's making under $400,000 a year won't see their taxes go up by a penny. Um, folks who make more than $400,000, and particularly folks who make more than $10 million, will see their taxes go up. Um, I think there are 30,000 folks around the United States who make more than $10 million. I'm not sure any of them live in the district I represent. Um, I can tell you there's 121,000 kids who live in my district who will benefit from the child tax credit, and a lot in Grays Harbor County. Representative Kilmer, thank you so much for the work you're doing on behalf of, of Aberdeen and Grace Harbor. Um, we're hearing a lot of concern about the IRS's ability to handle tax returns. Uh, is Congress going to give the IRS more money to staff up? I appreciate the question, and uh, this is a significant issue because you know, as, and and we saw this uh, not just related to um, uh, to to tax returns, but we also saw it in the early stages of the pandemic. Those pandemic relief programs, you know, actually ran through the um, through the IRS. Um, we actually, I just joined a bipartisan group of members of Congress and leading a letter to the IRS outlining some of the concerns ahead of tax filing season. We know that there are existing backlogs and delays and the ability, the inability to staff the taxpayer advocate service phones, that, that's been a real problem. And so we have um, just sent a letter to the IRS asking them, one, to halt some of the automated collections from now until at least 90 days after April 18th of 2022 to delay the collection process for filers until any active and pending penalty abatement requests have been processed to streamline um, some of the process for taxpayers that have been impacted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, uh, to provide some tax penalty relief for taxpayers who paid at least a good chunk of their taxes that were due during the pandemic. So rather than wasting some of the IRS resources on going after folks who may have just been hit hard during the pandemic, giving them some grace um, is part of our request. And then by, and the other request to your point is to expedite the processing of returns. Um, so that for folks who are expecting a, a, a refund that they're, they're able to get them more quickly. That was a bipartisan uh, letter to the IRS. Um, I think we had a, you know, a couple hundred members of Congress do that outreach. So yes, that is an area that's getting a lot of attention within Congress right now. So um, Congressman Kilmer, um, thank you for your support these last few years for the North Shore Levy Project. We are applicants for a BRIC grant, and I think we are also going for the FEMA flood mitigation. Um, what do 
what do you need? Do you need anything else from us to actively and proactively go after that for us? Because that's a game changer for our community when you talk about a community that has been left behind. Well, one, I applaud the council and the city staff for going after that money. Um, you know, that as a as a member of the Appropriations Committee, one of the things that I have fought hard for is to expand some of the assistance to communities that have experienced persistent flooding. Because we know right now, to, to um, Councilman Taylor's uh, earlier question, we have $2 million per year leave our community in flood insurance payments. And if we can address some of those issues and pull some of those properties out of the floodplain, we keep that money in the community. So um, to answer your question, I, I think the fact that the city's going after that funding is is a big difference for um, for taxpayers and ratepayers and insurance payers. In the city, um, I will let you know that we are advocating um, as clearly and as aggressively as we can in support of your community in the uh, appropriations process, which is why it was one of the community project funding um, priorities that I advanced. And we want to see that make it across the finish line. Um, in terms of your applications to FEMA, there are some restrictions under our ethics rules around how actively I can um, I can advocate, but as I have in the past, we will um, provide letters of support and do everything we can within the ethics guidance um, to support your community because I want to see you get that money. Thank you. You bet. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Thank you for your time, Congressman. I just have one question. Families are really struggling with skyrocketing prices on everything right now. What is Congress doing to address rampant inflation? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I, I sort of spoke to that at the end of my remarks. The things like the child tax credit provided a, um, a tax cut to put money in people's pockets. Uh, 35 million American families benefited from that under the American Rescue Plan. And what what the studies have shown is one that cut childhood poverty in our country in half this last year. That's a really big deal. And two, by and large, families use that to to pay bills, to pay for food, um, and to meet uh, to meet essential needs. So that's a that's a clear priority. As I mentioned, a, a big focus within the Build Back Better Act is just to try to give people a break with some of those things that do cost money: the cost of healthcare, the cost of prescription drugs, the cost of housing. Um, the cost of paying for college, um, and the and the cost of childcare. So all of those are priorities that are addressed within the Build Back Better Act. Beyond that, there's a focus um, within the America Competes bill that was just introduced this week to try to make make more stuff here in America. Part of the reason we've seen rising prices is because of disruption of our supply chains as a consequence of the pandemic. The United States is too dependent on other countries. Um, for for some of the products we purchase. And we got to make more stuff in America. And so a big focus within this America Competes bill is to do that, to bring back American manufacturing and to make more things in America. I mean, just as an example, part of the reason, I mean, drive by any of your car lots right now, there's not a lot of cars being sold right now because we don't have enough microchips and we're dependent on China and and. Taiwan and Indonesia for microchips. Well, we should we should do that in the United States. So that's part of the focus too. And then finally, gas prices are something that I'm certainly conscious about as someone who puts about 40,000 miles on my car driving around the 6th Congressional District each year. And it's a pinch for a lot of families right now. Um, it's to the um, administration's credit that they um, have tapped some of the strategic uh, petroleum reserve that provides some help. There's going to be consistent focus within Congress to try to address this issue of rising gas prices as well. So I appreciate the question. It's something that I'm I'm hyper focused on because um, all of us should be concerned if families are having a hard time being able to purchase the things that, things that they rely on. Well, thank you, Representative Kilmer. I know you um, had heard from many of our council members. Um, they're appreciating it their appreciation as well. So I want to echo that and you're welcome to come back anytime to speak to the council. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. You bet.
thanks again, everybody. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your service. And uh, Mr. Mayor, good to see you on my screen. I um, hope everybody's hanging in there. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's move over to department head updates. And rather than calling on each of you individually, I'm going to try something a little bit different and ask that if you do have an update, if you will just come on camera and uh, raise your hand or use the raise hand feature. And um, I'll invite you to come off of mute. And if there's a handful of you, um, I'll let one person speak first and then I'll let uh, the next person know who's on deck. And I see Director Barnum came on camera first. I feel like I won a game show. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So tonight on the agenda, I have two items. Uh, the first one is asking the council to authorize me to accept the quote from CXT Products. Uh, they are a member of Sourcewell, which the city is a member of that buying group. Uh, CXT also just emailed me that on January 6th, they became an approved vendor for Washington State Enterprise Services as well. Uh, so we did not have to go through the normal bid process because they are a member of both of those buying groups. Uh, the amount for the restroom is just over $226,000. Uh, that's $5,000 over what I had budgeted for the restroom. Uh, but when I put the budget together for the full project, I included a contingency amount of about $45,000 uh, for any unanticipated additional costs. Uh, this is being paid for by a combination of a Recreation and Conservation Office state grant that we were awarded in 2021. Uh, we received a grant from the Grace Harbor Community Foundation and Aberdeen Little League has also committed an additional $14,000 to the project. Uh, we pay for it. And then once the RCO has verified that the project is complete, that is the restroom has been installed, then they reimburse the city for the expense. Uh, the other item that I have on the agenda is also being paid for by the same RCO grant. It's replacing the fencing at the Pioneer Park Little League field. Uh, the contract was included in the committee report and the contract was reviewed by our legal counsel. Um, this one project actually came in, I wanna say just under budget by, under budget by about $2,000. So we saw a little bit of savings in what I expected for the fencing project. Uh, for that one, I did use the MRSC roster and sent out a request for quotes to about 200 different contractors and RC Fence was our low bidder. Uh, the other update I have is I just wanted to let you know uh, about the uh, building that the city is in the process of purchasing for the museum warehouse. We did have to put another extension on the closing date we are in negotiations with the Salvation Army regarding the terms of the lease. The Salvation Army will be leasing a portion of the first floor of the building from the city. Uh, we're hopeful uh, that we will have a contract uh, and lease for the council to approve at the February 9th city council meeting. Also regarding the Wilson Creek Bridge, which is the bridge at the entrance to Morrison Riverfront Park, uh, SCJ Alliance plans to visit the site with the geotech uh, next week. They hope to have the topographic and utility locate survey completed uh, on February 3rd. Once they have that information, then they can begin uh, the design for the various alternatives uh, for replacement or modifications to the bridge. Uh, also wanted to let you know that the Parks Department offices are now fully operational at the new offices across the street. Uh, I wanna thank Wayne Schmidt and Adam Johnson for all their help. The first month we didn't have internet and we didn't have phones. Uh, so we were very resourceful and I conned a couple of our neighbors into sharing their Wi-Fi with us. So we were able to still operate in the space. Um, we do love our new office spaces. Uh, so I wanna thank the mayor and the council for uh, providing us the opportunity to move across the street. 
while it was not our idea, um, we did not ask to move. Um, we were asked to move. Uh, it turned out to be a positive move for the Parks Department. So thank you for supporting us with our move. And lastly, just another reminder that the Board of Museum and History will be having their meeting, which includes a strategic planning session on Tuesday, February 1st at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. If you go to the city's website on the museum board page, uh, the Zoom meeting login is there along with the meeting agenda. Uh, the public is encouraged to attend. You can send your comments to me in advance if you would like to my email, which is on the screen uh, and also on the city website. And you will, the public will also have an opportunity to speak at the meeting. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Questions for Director Barnum? Yes, go ahead. Um, how much space is the Salvation Army um, requesting to use and, and what are they going to be doing? They are going to use, I think it's um, 2,500 square feet. If you're facing the building, it's on the left hand side. And I think they're using it for food service, like food bank. And the mayor's nodding his head, yes, for food bank operations. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's taking a little bit longer because we're actually dealing with the Salvation Army corporate offices, which are in California, New York. So the process moves a little bit slower, even slower than. Um, local government can move, <laughs> we have found. So is having the Salvation Army there, um, can the museum still do strategic planning and plan for that space if they're leasing it? Is there like a, are the, is there bookends on it? Um, I know that within the lease, there are terms should one or the other party want to um, break the lease. I think there's a notification process required, but I'll double check on that, but I'm pretty sure that's in there. It is in there and the lease is for one year. Um, it's potentially renewable, but uh, they're using a small, actually a small section of the building that Floors run close to 9,000 square feet average throughout the whole building, and they're using a small area on the one side. And they've had this food bank in there for I don't know how long, for, for quite a while. Um, and they're trying to prepare an, another space in another part of town for themselves, and that's in the process. So they figured if they could stay for an, at least another year, they'd have that available. So uh, I think during the planning stage of all this, it'll be nice to have a little income off of this. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Director Barnum. Next, I see Chief Shoemate. Thank you, Council President uh, Katchman. And so um, I won't get into public safety. We met earlier and I will leave that to public safety chair, Debbie Ross. But there is, uh, there's an item that I wish to bring up, um, a few items, if you will. Uh, I think it's timely given the legislative session, 2022 legislative session has just started. So uh, a great deal of my time over the past month and a half has been spent dealing with that legislative session. Again, it started on January 10th. Um, it's only a 60 day session. So a great deal of time was utilized uh, reviewing pre-filed bills, uh, have reviewed some bills from uh, Senator Jeff Wilson, Representative Jim Walsh, which I've had communication with, with on their pre-filed bills, um, had had communication with uh, Representative Joel McIntyre, and we've also had weekly meetings with our Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Um, as I shared with the council back in June of 2021, with respect to uh, what we referred to as the police reform bills, uh, there were certainly some areas that uh, law enforcement had concerns. Um, I, I can say that there has been some positive movement uh, with respect to some of those um, 2021 police reform laws. Um, they're calling them legislative fixes, if you will. One such area is uh, referred to as the uh, ITAs, we call it the Involuntary Treatment Act. 
prior to last year, law enforcement was able to take people into protective custody if they were a threat to themselves or others and would be able to assist to transport them to a medical facility for clearance before they were then, if, if need be, taken to a facility for further mental health treatment. Um, it was House Bill 1310 uh, that dealt with, and it had been specifically removed ITAs that limited uh, law enforcement's ability to really do that. And I think the legislators recognize that, that shortcoming. And so it does appear that there are fixes as it relates to that. Now, as a side note, um, had an opportunity to sit in with the Hoquiam City Council meeting just this past um, Monday. And I, I will tell you that Law and Fire has had significant challenges uh, in 2021, and it's continuing as it relates to being able to send people to our local hospital. Um, the, the figure that had been shared at the Holcomb City Council meeting is that the hospital had been on divert, I think it was 241 times, if I recall correctly. And so what happens is individuals, whether it's from the fire service or law enforcement, we have to look outside Race Harbor County because typically Summit is so small that they, they often will go on divert shortly thereafter. And so it takes our resources out of the out of the county unfortunately oftentimes as i've shared with the with the challenge of transporting individuals who are in crisis um, they're just not willing to go beyond uh, grace harbor county and so it uh, it creates a lot of problems for law enforcement uh, a lot of individuals end up uh, committing crimes and they end up being in our jails and that really is not where they need uh, for those who are experiencing mental health challenges um, so it may be um, so uh, the Holcomb City Council, they had invited, uh, it was the CEO, Tom Jensen from, which is now Harbor Regional Health, uh, used to be Grace Harbor Community Hospital. They had two of their commissioners. There was a great deal of time spent on discussion with respect to the challenges and also the frustrations. And uh, perhaps uh, that may be something worthwhile for the council to consider to bring them on as obviously they are within the city limits of Aberdeen. Um, so back to the legislative session, uh, there are still ongoing concerns, however, with some of the fixes as it relates to current bills, um, and as well as some of the new bills being proposed. Uh, one such bill actually received information today from the Association of Washington Cities, this is very concerning, and that's House Bill 1202. It really deals with the process involved uh, with suing cities and counties. Uh, the concerns include uh, the way the law or that bill was written, it appears that it would could potentially further divide officers and administrators of agencies in the defense claim. Um, it's the belief that it would reduce a, a lack of legal clarity, if you will, with for officers as they're being asked to enforce law with, uh, to be quite frank, some uncertainty about the laws, which, of course, we are hoping to get some clarification on that. But that adds to civil liability and, and it, it could add to potentially a loss of job if they assumed incorrectly. And I think more importantly for AWC, uh, it puts entities in the state of Washington um, who are already struggling to find insurance due to, I, I, I think the best way to put it, uh, Washington State's generous tort climate. Um, the reality is that this bill could lead to a reduction in law enforcement services or law enforcement services may be discontinued by some of our smaller cities uh, if they cannot get insurance. So um, lastly, I, I want to mention briefly, and I mentioned this back in June to the city council then and uh, citizens in attendance, and that's Senate Bill 5476 from the 2020 legislative session. And that was the legislature's fix for the state versus Blake decision, which that was a Washington State a Supreme Court a decision that possession of illegal drugs was unconstitutional as it was written. The legislature's fix um, made it a misdemeanor offense, but there was a great deal that went into that before you can pursue misdemeanor charges. Um, and as I shared with the Public Safety Committee, law enforcement, as it stands now, if we contact somebody who is in simple possession of meth, heroin, fentanyl, um, it's, still, it's still contraband. Ideally, we should be confiscating that, um, should try to get a statement from the person that we took it from. That then goes into evidence. There's a whole process for which that happens. The police officer then has to do a report. Our support staff then has to enter that information as a contact for that individual. That individual actually uh, get, will get at least three times before there is a potential for criminal charges. And mind you, it is only a misdemeanor offense. 
And then even after that, the law recommends that the prosecutor's office, again, offer a referral uh, to those charges. So hopefully you can appreciate um, the frustration with officers. And I will tell you from the chiefs of police and sheriffs throughout the state of Washington, that it is a challenge to get our officers to proactively uh, um, enforce this because as it stands now, and this is where I hope the community continues to be involved with our legislatures, if nothing changes at this point, that legislation is scheduled to expire on July 1st of 2023, which then, if there are no changes, would make possession of these poisons, in my opinion, legal. And I, I think that's just the wrong direction to go. Um, so uh, just a few other points I uh, just want to share. I'm sure if you haven't read already, there was one citizen complaint from Mr. Daniel McBride. I'm very familiar with Mr. McBride. I appreciate his passion for wanting to clean up Aberdeen. We've had many engagements with Mr. McBride over the years. Um, it, so our preference is if, if a citizen is not happy with the service from, a, from an officer that they request to speak to the supervisor immediately, oftentimes that can get resolved. It's unfortunate when uh, the complaints, rather than go that route, will go to social media or beyond. But in this in this matter, I did look into the matter. There was a younger officer that handled it. There were nine other calls going on at the time. One was a domestic violence assault. Um, while I appreciate the officer made the effort to call uh, Mr. McBride, obviously my preference would have been the next available unit would have responded to that area. Um, and I, as I think if you read that, this is the area of the cold weather shelter we have had ongoing challenges with that facility. We've had triple the number of calls that we had from the other facility that was ran the year before. And so we are working through that. We've had a few meetings now with stakeholders, which included the county commissioners, as well as the management that runs that. And so we're hoping that there will be some improvements on that front. Um, but it, it's, so we, we are working on that internally that we, we, we need to provide a better service than what was displayed there. And that's on me. Um, and then lastly, I'll just share that, um, like I did last year, I do plan on providing an overview of what ultimately comes from the 2022 administrative or legislative session with city council, though I do expect it to be much sooner than it was last year for two reasons. Number one, it's only a 60 day se session, so it's a much shorter session. But number two, I'm hoping that there are not gonna be nearly as many unanswered questions as there were last year. And that's really what delayed uh, our ability to provide, to try to provide some oversight of what was going on to the city council. So uh, I'm sorry to take up that much time, council president uh, Catchman, but I am open to any questions. No problem, great updates. Thank you for sharing. Were there any questions? Feel free to come off mute. Uh, some of the you were you were mentioning there were quite a bit of, of calls over at the cold weather shelter. Correct. Uh, recently, um, can you tell us about any of them? Uh, well, there was ninety some of them. So I mean, we've been called there numerous times, and so um, I I mean we had, we've made arrests uh, there as well. Some for illegal drug activity. We made we arrested one individual for illegal um, fire. Um, things of that nature. So, um, but it's a full array. I mean, like I said, we averaged one call per day with the facility that was ran by CAP, and and we're it's we're dealing with uh, three times as many calls. So it, it has been problematic. Obviously, our preference is to do what we can to try to avoid having all those calls. But it's it is it. Well, it's just, they have not been quite as responsive early on as when it was ran by CAP. And I think we're working through those issues. And so hopefully we'll have some uh, positive, positive responses from our recent meetings with them. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. And I'm not seeing any other department heads jumping on camera, raising a hand here. Nope. Um, so I'll hand it over to Mayor Shave. Do you have any updates tonight? Unmute. Um, just briefly, I uh, wanted to mention that the Ward 2 seat is open. We have one candidate, uh, Mr. Correct me if I'm saying this wrong, Gakin. Gay. <laughs> Uh, it has applied for the seat. And so I think uh, as a council, what we normally do is set 
a, um, a, a closure date. So uh, does the council want to have a closure date like at the next council meeting and, and uh, a vote on whatever candidates uh, have filed or, or have uh, sent, sent us an application? Mayor Shape, has that been advertised out? What? I know in the past it's been posted in the agenda. Are there other requirements for how it does that to be posted in newspapers or anything like that? Well, I think that's a good idea to do that. Um, whether we have or not, I don't think we have. So this just kind of came up and there was other things. And so this is like the why I'm mentioning it now. It's the really the first time it's been mentioned, I think, uh, since uh, Council Member Meskis resigned. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, get a notice in the media, uh, however we're required to do that. And then uh, sometime next month, we need to bring it up and fill that seat, so. Okay, uh, what else is happening? Let's see, we, oh, uh, council member Taylor. Um, I, I didn't fully understand that. So we're gonna put it out to be at and we're, we're gonna make the announcement for it. And then at the next council meeting, we're going to vote on it. Is that what was being said? I may have misunderstood. Well, February 9th might be too soon now. So the, we have the, 90 days. Yeah. So the the end of February or even into whatever the council wants to do. Um, let's see, where was I going? Uh, well, I was working, I worked on a mandatory vaccination and testing policy. Uh, staff was involved. We were working on it. Uh, not that I wanted to, but the uh, Supreme Court helped us out there and ruled that we don't have to do that. So that solves that. I'm very happy that they did that. Uh, I want to mention uh, Todd Mitchell stepped up and asked if he could help uh, do something to clean up the uh, camp behind City Hall. And he did a great job this weekend. Uh, City hauled off two big, I think two big dump truck loads and one smaller dump truck load uh, of trash out of there to the dump. So kudos to Todd Mitchell. He did a great job. I appreciate him stepping up. He's built a rapport with a, a bit of a bit of a rapport with the <laughs> with the campers out there, and uh, so he was able to work with them pretty well. And that's all I have. Were there any questions for the mayor from council? Seeing none, we will move on to our non-standing committee reports and any council members that have committee um, or commission reports, um, please feel free to raise your hand. Council person Ross. Thank you. I, uh, last Thursday, I attended two meetings. One was with the board meeting for the Downtown Aberdeen Association. Um, we talked about some of the things we'd accomplished last year. Um, we finally received the highway sign for labeled the Nirvana 666 sign and looking forward to getting that placed for people to see and take pictures with, et cetera. And we're working on upcoming things for 2022. And then later in the evening, I um, attended the Council of Government meeting and we, um, reviewed the 2021 financials and um, I had one more thing. Oh, we approved the 2022 cost allocation plan. So that's it for me. Thank you. 
Thanks, Councilperson Ross, and thanks for all the updates on Downtown Aberdeen Association. Any other non-standing committee reports from council members? Councilperson Morrison, I saw your hand waving. Thank you. Um, last week I attended a virtual town hall that was put on by our 19th legislative district representatives. And it's a short session, it's off to a busy start. But one of the things that I wanted to mention that they repeated often and kind of bouncing off what Chief Shoemate said, there's a lot of bills going in for fixes. And if the public has any input that they would like to provide, they are highly encouraged to sign up and read about the bills or participate in the different sessions. And they can do that by going to leg.wa.gov, leg.wa.gov. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councilperson Ellis, I saw you raising your hand as well. Thank you. Uh, last night I attended the Seaport um, board meeting just to see what was going on there and um, uh, took a whole lot of notes and they have quite a few interesting projects in the works and um, hopefully I can um, um, be added to the board and continue to go to those meetings. Thank you. Any other updates from council members? I was able to attend the flood authority meeting last week. There was a lot of discussion about our um, near record snow, water, flood, melting event and the tidal influence in Aberdeen. So, and, but also a lot of really good discussion about how some of the work over the past 10 years, um, you know, helped make it not as bad as it could have been. And so we just need to continue working on our flood mitigation, on chronic flooding, but also these, you know, once in a decade, every 10, 20 year events are the ones that um, we're really preparing for. And it was my honor to serve as a member of the police VIPs and help with the service for um, our um, fallen firefighter um, at the Midlighter service. And just, you saw the numbers that the fire chief shared about the enormous, enormous amount of work that our firefighters are doing and the call volumes. And just when you think you're so busy, you can't do anything else, we find a way to come together as a, it was awe-inspiring. I mean, I spent all day in the parking lot, okay? I wasn't, I, that was my contribution because I wanted to be able to support our fire guys. But I watched that from the outside looking in and it was awe-inspiring. You guys, the family and the community of firefighters and public safety and the service that they, they, they found time for one of their own when they're busier than ever. And it was an amazing thing. It was very, very special. So um, I just um, have my hats off to the fire department for supporting the fire, the uh, police department for supporting the fire department at such an, at a, at a, an important time. And we had volunteers from other departments coming into our community so that our police and fire could honor one of their own without worrying about having to go on calls. It was an amazing day-long day long thing. It, all the work that went into that, I, I can't even begin to describe what I watched the whole day uh, and, and it was amazing. So that's, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also thank you for everything that you did that day to, to help out as well. Any other comments from council? Seeing none, this will conclude the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to hand it over to Mayor Shave. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mayor Shave, and it's Wednesday, January 26, 2022 at 8.14 p.m. And I call the Aberdeen City Council meeting to order. Uh, public comments and public hearing comments are included during the Zoom video meetings. The public was notified that if they wish to speak during the meeting, an email be sent to the city clerk at aberdeenwa.gov. 
and indicate if they would like to speak or have the clerk read the comment. If they desire to comment live, they will be called upon during the meeting and allowed to speak for three minutes. Uh, written comments, all the written comments provided before the meeting have been provided to city council members and will be read into the record. Uh, city Deputy City Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Obi. Here. Ellis. Here. Brancy. Here. Catchman. Here. Lawrence. Here. Mackey. Here. Morrison. Here. Pertini. Here. Ross. Here. Shaw. Here. Taylor. Here. Shave. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Next Here. item is, go, go ahead. Mayor Alex. Shave, I would make a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. I second. Ellis, second. <laughs> motion was made and seconded. I didn't catch who actually got in there first, seconded. Uh, Debbie, or was Debbie Ross seconded? Okay. It was a close call, so. but Debbie came in by the touch of her hat in front of Ellis. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. A uh, motion was made and seconded to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is additions or deletions. Does anybody have any additions or deletions? I do. <laughs> I would like to add some appointments to the agenda, if I may. I would like to appoint uh, to the Brace Harbor Historical Seaport Board, Council Member Liz Ellis to represent the city. Um, Bailey Cavender and Julie Kennedy. Uh, also a reappointment of Tim Howden to the Seaport Board. Uh, so moved. Well, one other, okay. And then I have one other appointment. Do we wanna add that all together or just keep them separate? That's fine, I'll withdraw. Um, I have one other appointment, uh, council member, Shaw was willing to sit on the civil service board representing the city. Are you still uh, okay with doing that, Council Member Shaw? All right. So we'll have that add that appointment too. Does the council want to do all the appointments in one motion? And uh, Rick, you were also going to add uh, Dean Shaw to the flood authority. Oh, that's right. And she even mentioned that. Okay. I'll make a motion to add all of these appointments to special agenda items. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Motion was made and seconded to add all these appointments to the agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on. Um, Deputy City Clerk, do we have any public comments? We have three public comments tonight, Mr. Mayor. All were received via email. We'll start with the first. This is um, signed Daniel McBride. Friday, January 21st, 2022, while returning from the gym around 4 p.m. today, I saw an old friend outside of the Calvary Church known to me as Headlamp John. He was washing down the sidewalk, so I stopped to say hello. We had a conversation, and he told me he has a ministry there, a faith-based recovery sobriety group. He even gave me a business card. Together, while discussing sobriety and its merits, we both observed a woman flailing around under a blanket on the corner of the market and K Streets 
in the cold weather alcove. She seemed to be hallucinating and also she had a needle in her hand and appeared to be injecting herself under the blanket. I reported the situation. John, my friend, said often there are transients in each alcove along that building injecting themselves, even just outside the doors where a self-help sobriety meeting is taking place. I reported the woman, her location and description to the non-emergency number, and about five minutes later received a phone call from the officer on duty. He asked me what was going on, and so I described the situation that had transpired there at K and Market. The woman with the needle, while well, the officer said he would document the circumstance and also that it was going on everywhere, and there's not much that can be done about it. The way the problem was dismissed is more disconcerting than the problem itself. Am I expected to look the other way? Am I expected to be a vigilante? What are the citizens of this community supposed to do in order to remain safe? Shelter in place? This whole situation is getting preposterous. Please respond to this email and address this matter as soon as possible. Sincerely, Daniel McBride. Public comment number two came in via email as well. It is signed April Obai, Ward 3. I know this town and a few new council members look down on the local homeless here in Aberdeen, Washington. However, why is there, has there been no vaccinations for COVID available to the homeless behind City Hall or the cold weather shelter? As someone that is getting over COVID, I had the luxury of recover, recovering in my own home. The homeless do not have that opinion. They're the most vulnerable and as humans, they also should be protected from this virus. Anyone looking into this? Public comment number three came in via email from Betty Worth, Ward 4. Direct this question to the Chief Hubbard. There are so many questions about how much it is going to cost homeowners if the regional fire authority passes specifically the fire benefit charge. If I have a home that has 7,000 square feet and there's a cost of 50 cents per square foot, am I going to pay an additional $3,000? And that is our public comments for tonight. Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering if there, because of the circumstances of the RFA being on the ballot, if we couldn't ask Chief Hubbard to respond to that question. At the pleasure of the council, I can address that. So um, I think we're mixing some things up. Um, first off, I want to thank thank um, Betty Worth for that question. I have been communicating with her um, offline to get some clarification. So the first thing I encourage anybody that has questions and what we've been putting out there is to for them to contact Corey Schmid, finance director for the city of Hoquiam directly, either email, which is C Schmid, S C H M I D at cityofhoquiam.com. They send her their address. She will tell them exactly what the impact of the RFA will be. Or they can call her at 360-538-3969. For the last month, she has been diligently responding to people that will call and say, I live at XYZ Broadway Street. And she can tell them exactly what it'll cost. Going to the root, the heart of the question, the 7,000 square feet, that if it's a house, that's a large house. If it's a business, it's mid-sized. The square footage is what's used for the fire benefit charge. So in communicating with Corey after seeing this question, she's at home, so she doesn't have the exact calculation. She has a spreadsheet that she plugs in. But based on the 7,000 square feet, the fire benefit charge would be about $900. Where the 50 cents per thousand and the dollar th per thousand come in is for assessed evaluation. So I want to make sure it's not 50 cents per th square feet, it's 50 cents per thousand of evaluation. So a $250,000 square house at 50 cents per thousand is $125. But if whoever is talking with um, Betty Worth, and thank you again for that question, wants to get the exact figure, contact Corey and she can give it that. And that's for anybody. Go direct to Corey, she'll give you the exact figure. I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Uh, anything else? 
before we leave the public comment period, is there any other co public comments? None. Okay. Moving on to the finance committee. Committee Chair Ellis. Thank you, Mayor. The finance committee met at 6 p.m. tonight with council members Piracini, Obe, Koshman, and city staff. And um, we talked about the reports and uh, we don't have any resolutions or ordinances to present. Um, so I'll start by making a motion to approve expenditures and payroll. A second. Thank you, motion was made and seconded to approve the expenditures and payroll. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote, please. Motion to approve accounts payable in the total amount of $1,625,981.72 and payroll in the total amount of $91,748.63. Check numbers 20859 through 20863, 75717, and 75990 through 76162. Wires 1298 through 1306 and 1308 through 1309. Obi? Yes. Ellis? Yes. Francie? Yes. Catchman? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Mackey? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Pertini? Yes. Ross? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Taylor. Yes. Motion approved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, council, then, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, then we have a report from finance and the parks director recommending that the parks director be authorized to accept the quote from CXT products for the purchase, engineering, and installation of a new public restroom building to be placed at the Little League Field for an amount not to exceed $226,062. This amount will be fully reimbursed through the grant. I move that we adopt that report. I second. Motion was made and seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And we have a report um, also from finance and the parks director recommending that the mayor be authorized to sign the agreement with RC Fence Construction for the installation of the new fence at the Little League Field for an amount not to exceed $22,688.64. This amount will be fully reimbursed through the grant. I move we adopt this report. I second. Motion was made and seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And lastly, we have a report from finance and the community development director recommending that advanced environmental be awarded the demolition contract for, 10, for 410 Grant Street. Uh, I move we adopt this report. And I second. Thank you. Motion is made second to adopt this report. All those in favor, or is there any discussion? I have uh, uh, Councilmember Shaw. No, let the chair go first. Councilmember oh. Ellis. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, this particular project is uh, in Ward 3, and it's been a bane to many of the neighbors who've put up with a big pile of stinky, messy debris for a long time. And um, this has been on the city's radar screen through 2021. There was a fire, unfortunately, the end of October. Um, there was a hearing in November. 
the bids were due January 17th. And with this contract, cleanup work will be completed by February 28, 2022. Um, that will just be a real relief to the immediate neighbors and and the riddance of an eyesore. So that'll be great. Thank you, Councilmember Shaw. I, I just wanted to note that the supporting documentation says that this um, structure is in the west end of Aberdeen, and I actually I think it is in east of F Street. East end. It says east of F Street. Yeah. It should be east of B Street. Um, do we need to make a correction to that? I think it's west of B Street. We can make a correction to that, but thank you. Very good. We'll check that out. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Every time I see seeing this report or discussion on this report, all I could think of is, yay. <laughs> it's a little been a long road to get this. Anything else, uh, finance chair Ellis? That concludes um, our, our business. Thank you. Thank you. I'm moving on to public works, committee chair report. Councilmember Shaw. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, we Public Works has one item on the agenda tonight that um, we have a we have a report. I'm sorry, I lost my place. I apologize. <laughs> Public Works has a report um, recommending that the city council pass a resolution setting the date of February 9th, 2022 for a public hearing for the Transportation Benefit District Annual Project Plan. I move we adopt this report. Second. Motion was made and seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Under discussion for all the new council members, this is something we uh, do every year about this time uh, is uh, to set our goals for uh, the new year uh, for the transportation uh, restoration projects. So that's all. That's what this is about. So, it and is. I would, and I would just um, share, um, add on to what the mayor is sharing is that if you read the report, you'll see that while this is on the agenda tonight to set the hearing, we will be receiving the actual plan prior to the deadline on the thirty first. So watch your emails so you can look and see what projects are planned. But this is also a time for us as council members to make sure and share with. Um, Rick Sanger and his crew um, projects that we might like to see added. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, under resolutions from Public Works, we have a resolution setting the date of February 9th for a public hearing on the annual project plan for the Transportation Benefit District for the year 2022. I move we approve, approve the resolution. Second. Thank you. Motion is made seconded to approve the resolution. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So next council meeting, February 9th, we'll have the public hearing. That's it from Public Works. Thank you. 
Public Safety Committee Chair Report, Council Member Ross. Thank you, Mayor Shea. It's a public safety met this evening at 6.30 p.m. And I have reports from both the fire chief and the police chief. So I'll just share some of that information with you before we move on to agenda items. So first for the um, fire department, um, I have a annual report for the fire service, fire service specialists for the year end uh, 2021. And just to share some of the things that went on, it's pretty impressive. There were 168 smoke alarm home visits, um, 86 smoke alarms were installed, and we have one confirmed safe from a smoke alarm installed by the Aberdeen Fire Department. We had a 169 public service assists, um, 19, um, Aberdeen Police Services, I believe, referrals, 48 Olympic, Olympic Area Agency on Aging referrals, and 70 caseworkers were contacted to coordinate patient care. And all of these things are important for the ongoing um, working with other um, agencies to improve our services. The Grace Harbor Quick Response Team for Aberdeen and Hoquim responded to 163 E911 calls for overdoses. They had 103 contact attempts from those and 79 um, connections and follow-up connections were made. Um, they when, were involved with the Grays Harbor County Emergency Expo and fit 28 children with new, new bicycle helmets. Um, they also were able to teach fire prevention education to 804 kindergarten through third grade students in the Aberdeen School District and St. Mary's Grade School. Um, the Grace Harbor Community Foundation awarded them funds and they offered basic first aid to 155 ninth grade students at Aberdeen High School. Twin Star Credit Union donated some money to provide public education programs in 2022. So over, overall, they had very a lot going on last year and I appreciate the work that went into putting this report together for us. Also from the fire chief, we had a summary of the total calls for the fire department in 2021. Um, and that was 6,181, which is up quite a bit from previous years. And we've got quite a substantial breakdown. If anyone's interested in this information, I'd be happy to share it with you if you reach out to me. Another interesting piece of information that he shared with us, um, there's a comparison over the last 10 years of the um, call volume. And I think it's interesting to note that in 2012, there were 4,767 total calls. And that goes all the way up to 6,181 for um, 2021. That's an additional 1,414 calls. So that's quite a significant increase in, um, in their response. And, I uh, commend all the work that they do to keep us safe. Lastly, from the fire department, uh, the general election is February 8th, 2022 for the Regional Fire Authority. And we are encouraging anyone with questions about the financing, because that seems to be the biggest area of concern, to reach out to Corey Schmidt at cschmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D, at cityofhoquim.com and she can help you work through those numbers so you understand what the direct impact is to you. Um, so moving on to the Aberdeen Police Department, we have three items on the public safety agenda this evening, and we'll get to those in a moment. Um, police Chief Shoemate wanted to shout out to the volunteers and police services for 2021, they contributed 1,662.5 hours of service, a contribution worth $24,937.50 to the city of Aberdeen. And I think that is just absolutely astounding and wonderful, and I appreciate them so much. So thank you, Vince. And um, also, as Steve Shoemate, or Chief Shoemate, um, mentioned during his presentation, we talked a little bit about the 2022 legislation and, um, and some of the issues and also 
address the, the letter from Daniel McBride, which he, he shared with you earlier. So with all of that, I'd like to move on to our agenda items. The first report, report from public safety and the police chief recommending the police department be allowed to surplus two vehicles along with other miscellaneous items to be sold through government surplus. These items are either obsolete or no longer useful to the department. I move we adopt this report. Okay. Second. Thank you. Motion was made and seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to the second report, we have a report from public safety and the police chief recommending that the police department be allowed to obtain a dedicated internet connection exclusively for the purpose of ICAC investigations for the fee of $200 per month. I move we adopt this report. Second. Motion was made seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And finally, we have a report from Public Safety and the Police Chief recommending that the police department be allowed to surplus two department issued firearms and collectively sell them to APOG in the amount of $2,000 to be issued as retirement gifts. Two new firearms will be purchased in their place. I move we adopt this report. Second. Motion was made and seconded to adopt this report. Is there any discussion? Under discussion, Council Member Ellis. Yeah, um, I, I, I understand that there's probably a precedent for this. And yet I think of other departments and how they have their PPE and other gear that um, supports their work. And yet, um, typically city um, property isn't surplus to give to other employees. And um, I'm, I, I have a concern about having more um, firearms out on the street and, and the cost to the city to replace perfectly usable firearms. Um, so I, I wanted to mention that, but I also appreciate that there are um, customs in place that have been in operation for a while. It's my understanding is that oh, I'll let Steve or Chief Shumate address this. Uh, thank you, and uh, I appreciate the inquiry, uh, Council Member Ellis. So I will just say in my nearly 33 years of doing this, anytime we've had a department member, and this goes back not only to the Sheriff's Office where I used to work, but um, as well with ABD for years, if we've had members that put in 25 or 30 years, in this case, we got one with 25 years and the other one with 29 years, it is it was practice that we that would be afforded to them. Uh, particularly in today's world where the it's kind of like vehicles, the price of firearms have do not change. And so the city really isn't going to be out no money. We get rid of two firearms that are four years old and we get to replace them with two brand new firearms that will then be issued to new employees that are going to be hired. And number two, I, you know, I, I can appreciate your thought about too many guns out there, but if we can't trust uh, retired law enforcement from keeping their one gun that I'm sure they have multiple other guns, then uh, it, that saddens me. So I, maybe I'm just giving a little personal commentary there. But anyway, hopefully that uh, shared or offered some uh, insight into your inquiries. And I'm definitely available for any other questions. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing that, oh, Council Member Shaw. Well, I appreciate the chief um, clarifying that this is not a gift. We're selling them to APOG. And it is, um, we do have a rotation on our purchase of both vehicles and rifles and weapons. And so, but also, hey, if the fire department um, wants to surplus and the fire union wants to, you know, buy um, gear, I, I, would, I would support that. 
the equipment that we provide to our employees is there some, especially um, a, a weapon or the gear you put on every single day where if somebody retires, I don't think we repurpose or reassign somebody's bunker gear. So I think it's a fine tradition and I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'm not seeing any, so all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor Shave. That's it for public safety. Thank you. Um, special agenda items. Uh, the only thing on here um, is Uh, Council Member, Council President Catchman, do you, is there something on here? Yes, we do have one report to share um, regarding our committee assignments for 2022. So I make a motion that we approve those committee assignments. Second. Motion was made and seconded to approve and accept committee assignments. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, I'll do the appointments uh, and I'm going to do them seaport separately. So I have an appointment to the flood authority. Uh, Council member Shaw will represent the city council and the flood authority. Also, Council Member Shaw would like to represent the City Council on the Service Civil Service Board. I would uh, accept an app uh, motion to approve. I so move. Second. Thank you. Motion was made and seconded to approve uh, the, that appointment. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Deanne. Appreciate it. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to appoint Liz Ellis to represent the city council, Bailey Cavender, Julie Kennedy, and, I, and also reappoint Tim Howden to the Seaport Board. I would accept a motion to do so. I so move. Second. Thank you. Motion was made and seconded to approve these appointments. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Council. Uh, next item on the agenda is city council comment period. Anything? Uh, Do I get my shape? appointment? You got a museum board. Did you oh. want a motion for oh. Councilperson Ross on the museum board? I would make that motion for you. I would appreciate it. I thought I seen that on last month's uh, agenda notes that we did that, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, that's, I wrote on mine, so I kind of messed it up and covered it up. That's why I didn't see that. <laughs> it, was, so, it was not on the last meeting, so okay. I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another, one other appointment is Council Member Debbie Ross uh, to represent the City Council on the Museum Board. I would accept the motion. So moved. Second, Ellis. Thank you. Motion was made and seconded to approve of Debbie Ross's appointment to the museum board. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much for catching me on that. I make it. Too much of a mess writing notes on here. Covered that up. 
Okay, now moving on to city council comment period. Anyone on the city council have anything they want to comment on? Council member Ellis. Thank you. Um, Grace Harbor and especially the Aberdeen area has a lot of talented artists who live and work here. And I'm pleased to have as my backdrop this evening, a gorgeous picture of the Chehalis River Bridge um, taken by Stephanie Bloomingdale Baltzel of Glimpses of Grace Photography. And um, I thought I'd rotate in um, various artwork that represents um, some of the talent we have here at our council meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the council? Council member Mackey. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I just want to remind everybody to be sure to be updated on your COVID shots. Get your boosters, get all that stuff done. My family just experienced eight of us all getting sick at the same time over the last two weeks. All eight of us had COVID and we got it from each other, we guess. And so, um, oh yeah, had shots. One of us did not. And um, make sure you get those boosters. Those are things you got to have too. So that's, that's all I have. Just be safe. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Morrison. Um, I'd like to go on a little trip down memory lane with the tassel. Uh, it was supposed to be closed in the summer of last year. Um, the previous council voted to secure that lot and voted for an amendment to the camping ordinance. And still they're there. And then I found out recently that um, they're being very combative with the city staff. Good for you. They are defecating in buckets and sticking it down the storm drains. And so my question is, when can we expect some movement on securing that lot and cleaning it up? Thank you. Thank you. The answer to that is uh, Chief Shoemate will have some information to announce next council meeting. To give you a clue, it's soon. <laughs> Anyone else on the council? Um, I want to put my um, my citizen hat on for a moment and talk about the RFA just briefly um, because there is so much conversation going around about the cost, and that's good. Everybody needs to know what the costs are. But here's the thing. Uh, the reason this whole issue has come up to create an RFA is because it's a solution to a dilemma that communities like ours are falling into all over the country, everywhere. And RFAs are real common uh, uh, everywhere in the country. And that problem, that dilemma is it's becoming more and more difficult to finance uh, an active fire department and ambulance service. Uh, it, the costs continually go up, the equipment costs continually go up. It's just extremely expensive. And fire departments all over the country are dwindling until they find some solution. So there's things with the RFA that will be, will save, and that mostly comes into repetitious items that once the, if the RFA was approved, uh, we could save in that area. But money-wise, it's not really a, a, a savings. It, what we're saving is our fire department and our ambulance service. And as you can see by looking at my radio face, I'm getting old and I really appreciate uh, an emergency room on wheels being able to drive right up to my front door. Uh, and that's what we can save. And that's one of the things that's been 
a real blessing in this community for years and years that we've had this quality of service uh, instead of a scoop and run type service. So uh, if we don't pass the RFA, we're, there's two things going to happen eventually. We'll either have services start dwindling away or the city will have to focus more budget towards the fire department in order to keep this type of service. Um, and in our case, that simply means cutting something else in order to provide more funding for the fire department. And quite frankly, to me, uh, I'm a little ashamed as it is that our fire department uh, building has dwindled to the condition it's in, even though we've been uh, spending lots of money over the years trying to keep it maintained properly and so on. They just get old and they get worn out. And furthermore, it was never designed for today's technology. So either the city's going to have to find a way to put more money into the fire department, increase fees, uh, or we're going to lose some of the services. And that, to me, is the bottom line here. When you start talking about finances, yes, we're going to pay. But we have an awesome service that we're paying for. And if we don't create an RFA and spread those costs further around in order to maintain this service and keep it just secluded to Aberdeen or secluded to Hoquim, we're going to pay more. So that's my soapbox with my private taxpayer hat on. Now back to my mayor's hat. Is there anybody else on the council that has anything they want to say? Councilmember Shaw. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I was I was on the RFA, and I really appreciate your comments. I think one of the things that the RFA committee found was that Aberdeen and Hoquiam both, the level of service we're providing is not sustainable without additional investment and increased costs. That additional investment and increased cost is going to be less if we're in it together. But both cities are confronted with a level of service that we cannot sustain without additional investment. So the best thing that you said, and I wrote it down, is we, we all love our the level of service that we have and what we're saving is our fire department and our ambulance service. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Councilmember Ross. I would just like to say that um, a question was posed to Chief Hubbard earlier in the week and he wrote a wonderful response which I shared on my Facebook page about what happens if this doesn't pass. And um, I just think it's some, another way to look at the situation and for people to think about. So that's another uh, area you might find some information if, you, if you're interested. Thank you. One other thing there real quick, um, just in case anybody thinks that the general fund is getting out from under paying for the fire service, it is illegal for us. We have to pay at least what we're, we will need to fund the RFA at least what we're paying for fire service now. So it's not like the city is, the general fund is out from under. We have an obligation to fund the IRA at the level we are currently funding our fire department. It's, um, it's just that the increased costs are, um, you know, an RFA can do the increased costs that we need to invest better than we can alone. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, Debbie? If there's no further business, I move we adjourn. If there's no objections, I'll call this meeting.